Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. My name is Leonardo and if this is your first time here, in this channel we talk about music production and composition. This video is part of a series called Rescoring Game Music, in which we analyze and rescore game classics. Today's episode is about Sonic the Hedgehog and we will take a look at how the song was made and try to recreate it by ourselves. So let's get a good dose of nostalgia. I still remember when I played Sonic the Hedgehog for the first time. I was around 7 or 8 years old and I was playing in a video console that was not mine, it was my cousin's. I couldn't play very well, so I couldn't even pass the first or two stages, but I would be amazed by the sounds, the colors, the movement and of course the music. It would stick in my head like an earworm and I would keep singing and singing it over and over. And that's funny because when I was making this video and I had to transcribe the tune, I was listening to it over and over and I still wouldn't get tired of it. But that's enough introduction. Let's get straight into the topic. Today's video is divided into four main sections. The first one is the analysis of the musical context. Secondly, we're gonna look at the Sega Mega Drive hardware. Third, we will analyze the Green Hills tune. And fourth, we will compose our own music. But I am just realizing that for the first section we actually need to travel back in time. And we also need to travel in space. More specifically, we're going to one of my favorite eras, the 80s. And we are going to Japan. During the 80s, Japan was living its golden age as a technologic superpower, and it seemed that nothing could stop it. The urbanization and economic growth during this decade shaped the youth of millions of people who were living an urban dream and empowered the consolidation of new forms of art such as anime, video games and new genres of music. During this decade, a new style of music was taking over Japan. It was called J-pop. It was a mix of funk, disco and jazz fusion, digested by highly skilled and talented musicians, supported by unprecedented technology and curated from a completely different musical background. J-pop soon became an identity for a whole generation who were nurtured in the magical, superficial and nostalgic expression of their music. When J-pop grew up, by the end of the decade, it had its first child, called City Pop. And incarnated by incredible artists like Maria Takeuchi, Miki Matsubara, Tatsuro Yamashita or Masato Nakamura. And this is the one we were looking for. In 1990, Masato Nakamura was approached by Sega, who were looking for a fresh and modern concept of music for the video game they were developing. Sonic the Hedgehog was still a project by then, and a young Masato Nakamura would be in charge of making the music for all the levels of the game. Of course, the difficult part was to embed all that music inside a cartridge which could only be played by a YM2612 chip integrated in the Sega Mega Drive that had been launched just about over a year before. Now that we have some musical context, it's time to look at what Masato Nakamura had to go through in order to be able to put music in the system. In order to answer that question, we will analyze the hardware used in the Sega Mega Drive, and that will also tell us how to imitate those sounds. So let's get into it. In my previous video, I talked about the NES and the limitations of its audio chip. When I was a kid, I remember how much more I preferred my cousin's Mega Drive over my NES. By then, I didn't know that my video console had been launched in 1983, while the Sega Mega Drive was launched five years later, in 1988, and therefore it could benefit from countless advances and learnings from the previous years. So, talking about the Mega Drive, the sound chip it mounted was called a YM2612, which supported six independent frequency modulation channels, 
including a sample player plus an additional Texas instrument SN76489, another chip that provided four extra channels with noise generators and oscillators. A total of 10 channels that allowed for remarkably complex music and sounds, but if you pay close attention you can still hear some glitches and missed musical lines while certain effects have to be played. In order to replicate the legendary sound of the Mega Drive, we would need just a few FM synths, square wave generators, noise generators and some nice samples to play. I have decided to use the solution by Inphonic, which replicates the original sound of the console. This company also makes a totally free program that allows you to split Sega Mega Drive music into their different channels and then load the relevant patches into their plugin. I have to say it is handy but not perfect. I could hear a great difference between some of the sounds being played by the console and those generated by the plugin, but some production magic could do the trick. The additional oscillators are easy to replicate, as you know, I use Serum for this. And for the other samples, well, I am a bit of a nostalgic guy and I must say that the drum samples from the Mega Drive sounded quite similar to a toy I still have the Casio SA10. So I decided to use the sound patches from my beloved toy and tweak them a little bit. Now we have all our sounds and tracks in place to be filled with great music. Great, now we know how this music was born and how it was implemented in the console. Third, let's take the score, squeeze it and see what we can get out of it. As I did in my previous race score, I transcribed the Green Hills theme to properly understand the music and extract all the information in it. So let's take a look and see what we get. First of all, the basics. We are in 4-4, up tempo, 150.5 bits per minute, and no key signature. At a first glance, we already see a lot we can easily recognize. We have F major 7, E minor 7, D minor 7 and C major 7 in the A part. All these chords are diatonic to C major, but I would argue this is modal music because somehow the place in which the music rests is F major, not C, so although the harmonic material is technically the same, we would say we are in F Lydian. Melodically, we have a couple of interesting things. The main melody consists of a series of similar statements with different levels of conclusiveness following a structure like A, A1, A, A2. Probably the most characteristic element of this section is the answer that one of the brass channels provides every time the melody rests. Other characteristic element is the descending line of the third synth brass channel, which somehow mimics the descending concept of the whole track, but we'll come to that later. The square wave oscillators fill in the harmony to get those wonderful and jazzy sevenths and the bass and drums keep a steady pulse that keeps the music going. Now, the conclusive progression for the A part is F major, E minor, D minor, C major, which is a diatonic descending line from a major chord to another major chord with some minor flavor in between. The second time the A part repeats, we get another melodic element from the second brass channel, which contrasts with the more rhythmically aspect of the question and answer lines we saw before. This melody functions as harmony filling, rhythmic contrast and intensity building towards the next section. In the B part, Masato Nakamura makes things a bit more interesting by the use of several different relationships. Harmonically, the composer maintains the descending chord progression, 
but in this case he makes use of some sweet modal interchange to bring us a chromatic descending line that starts on B flat major, followed by an A minor, followed by an A flat major, and ending on a G7 suspended 4 as some sort of light dominant which will resolve deceptively to the initial F major 7. The underlying rhythm of this section is rescued from the intro to recycle this pattern. This sort of clave will drive the synth brass section in its descending and ascending lines, bringing back a rhythmic concept that has been already exposed and mixing it with a twist of the descending lines concept we just saw. So, as a short recap, we have an up-tempo track in F Lydian with an intro, an A, A1 section and a B section. For the A section we have descending harmonies, descending melodies, interacting first and second melody, intensity building additional instrument in the second repetition, square wave oscillators filling in harmony and accentuating on a rhythmic pattern, a drum and bass groove that keeps things going. For the B section, we have a reminder of the intro, ascending and descending lines, and soft dominant suspended force with deceptive resolution. Well, well, here we are up for a new adventure. I like a lot to think about the creative process and how it works, because I think that somehow if I understand it well enough, I will be able to replicate it or facilitate it and ultimately be able to write more and better music. In any case, uh, when I make these videos, I try to depict this, the process that I follow so I can inspire you somehow. And literally what I do when I am writing music is accepting some limitations, fixing certain things, and then try to work my way in between so that something new comes up. See, for example, from the rules we have drawn from what we have learned before, there is a million things we could make. I mean, those rules do not necessarily say that the tune that we're going to write is going to be similar to, to the Green Hills tune. So what that means is that we need to copy some elements, in this case probably rhythm and sounds, then fix other elements so that these are still, and then try to make something in between that makes sense and that makes a tune that sounds like the one we are trying to imitate. So one thing that I do that helps me a lot to guide my thinking, my creative thinking when I am trying to write music is to play some sort of backing track in my head, to listen to it and to try to stick to it rhythmically and in terms of tempo so that whatever I build makes sense within that tempo. So in this case I'm thinking two, three, four, one, two, three. This is a sort of a very basic melody that I will show you how it develops afterwards. But I hope this gets you an idea and a sense of how I work and how you could work potentially when writing your music. So, okay, now we have a concept for the main melody which we should develop and close and answer it in many different ways. That's more for the arranging part. But I will already start thinking about the structure of the song, what I want to write what I want to achieve. So I have a mental structure that allows me to compose and write music for that specific container. So I, I decided to go for a different structure than uh, Masato Nakamura did. In my case, I want to go for an A part and B part and then adding another instrument and doing the same A part and B part. So it would be sort of two different parts with different instrumentation but presenting the same musical material. Now for the B part I wanted to create some contrast and focus a little bit less on the melody, more on the harmony. So in this case I decided to create some contrast using the harmony itself. You see, uh, downwards was kind of the concept that Masato Nakamura used for Sonic. I decided to use 
a little bit of a twist of the same but in the B part let's make some contrast and let's go upwards instead and I will use harmony for that starting from D minor we have So what is this? Very simple. We have a D minor, which is diatonic. Then we have a D sharp diminished. And we go now to an E sus4, which resolves to E major and wants to resolve somewhere. As I said before, the focus is going to be more on the harmony in this part. So in order to take the melody out of the spotlight, I decided to make something repetitive that does not take the attention for the harmony. What we have is this. As you can see, it's quite repetitive and it won't take much attention from what's going on here, which I think it's more interesting. All right, now we are starting to have something that makes more sense musically. We have a melody on one hand that functions and that closes. And on the other hand, we have a B part that somehow answers to this A part. To me, now it's the moment to write the intro for this, because now we know what we are writing an intro for. In my case, I decided to go for the same concept as Masato Nakamura did, which is the pedal point in C. And the progression that I chose was this one. So another part that I've also borrowed from Masato Nakamura, or at least the concept, is this descending line that you can hear in the intro that you probably will all recall. That happens in the very intro and then there are other two channels doing... So these two combine and work very well. In my case, I did something slightly different, but following the same concept, and it goes something like this. So at this point, I believe I've shown you everything that I did, and all that's remaining is to hear how it sounds like. So without further ado, here it is. That's basically it. I really hope this video has brought you some value and that you see something useful in it. You know, it takes me literally 10 times more to make these videos than to make the actual tune. So a like, a comment or a subscription really goes a long way, especially now that I am trying to grow my channel. In any case, that's all I have for you today. Thank you very much for watching and see you next week.